face may look different and pretend that they're not American. But the first comment is, of course, we are American, period. And no matter what happens, we are going to make sure that everybody understands they are American, no matter what they look like, no matter who they worship, no matter who they love. And for have people question this type of terrorism and question what it is only adds more fuel to the pain that's already well Ooh, to the pain that's already there. <clears throat> only adds more fuel to the fire. Only adds more salt to the pain that's there. But we have to do more than send prayers and thoughts and well wishes, and we have to do more than just stand in solidarity. It's time for action. And that action must undo so much of the damage that was allowed to be pervasive in the past four years. We know and we want to make sure that people who do this are held accountable for the pain that they're causing, the pain of the people's families who lost those lives, but the pain of the people who are experiencing anti-Asian violence every single day. It's up tenfold in New York City. There is pain and trauma that's associated with that as well, and we can't ignore it. Last year, there was an anti-hate initiative that was, fu the funding was cut. The funding was taken away. And so while we hear cries uh, for increase in law enforcement, and we know they have a role to play, I'm appreciative of the leaders who are also standing with the black and brown community who know the impact that that often has on those communities on us saying, wait a minute, let's make sure that we do this right. And the way to combat hate education is with proper and different education. And there are things that can be done through community groups that actually asked for this money before this even happened. And that money was taken away. And what we're asking is not only that this funding be restored, but it be increased. Because it didn't even have enough focus on anti-Asian violence, even as people were blaming this community. By the way, that community has amongst the lowest uh, virus rate of any community I've seen watching the data. And the virus that came here were, came through Europe. But we didn't put enough money in there even for those groups. So while we are decreasing things like Division of Youth Community Development and trying to increase the NYPD, we want to make sure we send the appropriate message. And the message is the way to combat hate is to fund the folks behind you who have experience in these communities, have experience pushing back in hate. If you want to stand with them, if you want to treat, fund them. Fund them. Because we want to prevent this from happening. Law enforcement responds once it has happened, but the trauma is already done. So we're asking the city in this budget negotiation, and even in the state of the access to funds, to put this initiative back and fund even more than you were planning to fund last year. And so we're going to hear from a few folks today. First, I'd like to hear from Councilmember Adrian Adams, who's the co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus. It's important, and I, and I always want to thank the Asian leaders who stood and, and were yelling out Black Lives Matter uh, last year. And even before that, it was so important to the civil rights movement. I want to thank them, and we stand with them today. Thank you so much, Public Advocate Jamani Williams, and good morning. I am Councilmember Adrian Adams. I represent the 28th Councilmanic District in Queens. And before I begin my remarks, I just want to say that the attacks that happened in Atlanta were a hate crime. Let's be clear about it. Let's not mince any words. What happened in Atlanta this week was a hate crime despicable hate crime. So I'm proud to join public advocate Jamani Williams and our advocates today to condemn the recent vile attacks 
on the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I am horrified, saddened, and angered by the reprehensible murder of eight people in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian women. The shootings were just the latest in the really scary rise in the anti-Asian hate and violence we've seen around the country and in our city that we must address and put an end to immediately. And this starts with leadership. As the public advocate said, we are looking for a restoration and increase in funding in an area where funding was completely eviscerated. We need the funding back. As a member of the budget negotiating team of the New York City Council, I will pledge to continue to advocate for that funding to be restored and increased. We must denounce the recent shootings and the wave of anti-Asian violence, but also to tell our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities that you are loved. We see you, we hear you, and we are here to support you. As co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus of the New York City Council, I stand in full solidarity with our colleagues, with the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and everyone who stands in true unity to denounce hatred and bigotry. You have my full support, and we will continue to work together to end these hateful attacks. My heart goes out to the families and communities of those who were killed and injured during this week's shootings. I hope we will see swift justice for the victims and their families, and that the perpetrator is held fully accountable, not for his bad day, but for his killing spree. Again, thank you, public advocate, my friend, Jamani Williams, all of my colleagues in government that I know stand with me today, and all of our advocates and friends who stand to my left and to my right, who've been working to against this rise in anti-Asian hate. Let's stop hate in its tracks once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for your leadership as well. Uh, next, we're going to call up uh, Joanne Yo from the American uh, uh, Asian American Federation and Wayne Hall from the Chinese Planning Council. Thank you, public advocates, uh, for bringing us together. Thank you, our friend Jumani, for bringing us together. Thank you for always being such a powerful and thoughtful ally to the Asian American community. During such sad time in our city and country, it is so reassuring to have an ally we can trust and count on. Um, as Jumani said, we need to talk about the victims and we need to uplift their stories. I want to tell you about two of them. Hyun, Hyun Jung Park loved to dance and eat sushi. She was an elementary school teacher in our homeland, but immigrated here for all the reasons why immigrants come to America. Her 20-something-year-old son is now the head of household and having to take care of his little brother because his mother was gunned down. Mm -hmm. Xiaozi Tan went to China last year to celebrate Lunar New Year with her family, with her mom and her sisters. Her kids now um, are motherless. I want to tell you that the that behind the victim label, the six Asian sisters and the two res residents who were murdered on Tuesday were moms, sisters, daughters, and each had a beautiful story of joy, yeah. immigrant struggle, and love to tell. We now need to tell their stories because they are no longer with us. One year ago, I co-wrote an op-ed that the consequence of all of this unfettered scapegoating and hate against our community was going to lead to something terrible. And on Tuesday, my worst nightmares became reality in Atlanta with the deaths of eight people, six of them who are Asian women, women who look like me. During this time of so much violence and hatred directed at the Asian American community, one way to prevent tragedies before it starts. As Shimani said, we need support, we need money. We need lots of money with lots of zeros, elected officials, because we need to build solid foundations of community safety programs in language delivered with cultural relevance. So the solution to racism is radical investment in community and community groups. We need to have money to address mental illness, homelessness, and unemployment, and other challenges that have never been meaningfully addressed in this city. Federation is, uh, has been fortunate enough to be invited to sit with the Department of, U.S. Department of Justice leaders, with the White House Initiative, 
to present ideas on how what what is next. And I am certainly going to going to be raising the uh, points that um, our public advocate has shared. Um, and I want to tell you, this is my call to action for all of New York, all New Yorkers. Please call your elected officials to share your concern and show your support for the Asian American community. Ask that they put meaningful funding into um, the programs that we're talking about. Two of those, the, the funding that got cut last year, two of our member agencies were receiving that support. They were doing great on the ground, meaningful work, and now that program is no more. We really need that program back. Please ask your own organizations and companies to support AAPI community and to make meaningful investments in their own institutions to better protect those facing hate. Sign up through our upstander training to learn how to protect yourself and loved ones from hate through de-escalation and self-defense. And lastly, join us at our peace vigil on Friday, uh, this Friday, today actually, at 6 p.m. at Union Square. We are holding a vigil to mourn the victims of senseless violence and brutality and to recommit ourselves to building community to ensure greater safety for all of us. Please stay strong, please stay safe, and take care of each other. I also want to uplift all the groups in Atlanta doing the impossible work of supporting the victims, families, and healing our community at this time. I want to lift up Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta, National Asian Pacific Women, American Women's Forum, Center for Pan-Asian Community S Services, and so many others. Again, we stand with Jamani um, with the budget asks, and we are going to be asking for uh, budgets with many, many, many zeros. Don't be shocked, because we are not playing, and we are so committed to making sure our com no community in New York City ever has to be in this position ever again. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wayne Ho, and I'm the president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council, and CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services nonprofit. I want to thank public advocate Jamani Williams, council member Adrian Adams, and all the allies who are here today to stand together, not just Asian Americans, but black, brown, and other siblings together to say that there should not be hate in New York City and in the United States, that we denounce and condemn any hate crimes and violence against the Asian American community. Throughout the pandemic, for over one year, CPC had been providing essential services. So when New Yorkers were told to stay home, my staff were out in the field making sure that people were fed, people were housed, that they were getting the services that they need to have relief and recovery from the pandemic. Unfortunately, in the last year, I have had staff who have been spat on, who have been beat up, had things thrown at them, had racial slurs told to them. I have seniors right now who are eligible for the vaccine, but who are refusing to go because they are afraid of walking outside their homes. I have young people who are not going to our after school programs because they're staying home comforting their parents who have been attacked. What we need right now are resources from the state and from the city. Asian Americans make up 15% of New York City, 10% of New York State, but we get less than 1% of New York City social service contract dollars. We get less than half a percent of state social service contract dollars. The budget is a moral document. And right now, the moral thing to do is to stand up for the Asian American community. And we can do that best by supporting the Asian American community-based organizations that have been on the front lines, not just during the pandemic, but for the last several decades. We need the city council and the mayor's office to restore the hate crimes initiative. We need to make sure that all the Asian American organizations that have asked for discretionary funding and member items and borough delegation money to get that funding. We also need to remember that we need positive solutions. We need to invest in communities. We do not need to invest in over-policing. The NYPD is getting an enhancement of $196 million in the mayor's executive budget. Imagine what $196 million would do if it went to Asian American nonprofits that speak the language, know the cultures of their community members. We need restorative justice. We need mental health services. We need to address housing. We need more jobs. We need violence interrupters. We need upstander trainings. We need escorts to make sure people can get safely from their homes to vaccine sites. That's what we need to do right now. At the state level, 
the first time the words Asian American were ever in the state budget, which is a few thousand pages long. The first time the words Asian American was ever in that budget was four years ago when CPC got a line item. That is unacceptable that the nation's fastest growing, the state and the city's fastest growing population does not get a fair share of resources. We cannot balance the budget on the backs of the most vulnerable. What we need to do is promote budget equity, and that means getting resources to the organizations right now that know how to support our community members. Let's all stand together as one city to denounce hate and to make sure that we have safety for all and dignity for everyone where you live, work, play, sleep, eat, and worship. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we do have a, a, a few speakers left. We know it's cold, so we're going to ask folks to uh, just think about that while they're speaking, please. Next up, we have uh, Deepika from the Arab American Family Support Center and Vanessa Lee Wong from Chinese American Children and Families. The Arab American Family Support Center is deeply saddened by the horrifying shooting in the Atlanta area that killed eight people, the majority of whom have been identified as Asian women. We extend our deepest condolences to the families impacted, and we join the collective outcry for an end to such acts of hate. This latest tragedy follows a troubling increase in violent incidents targeting the Asian American community since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Asian American communities in New York and across the country, already grappling with discrimination, racism, and xenophobia, have also been made with hateful rhetoric and false narratives that can only intensify this pain. According to the New York City Commission on Human Rights, 205 incidents of Asian American discrimination in New York were recorded in 2020 alone, which is a nearly 600% increase from the previous year. And this does not include the unreported incidents that were unreported because of fear and uncertainty. The Arab American Family Support Center condemns these blatant displays of xenophobia and all forms of discrimination that has left our Asian American brothers and sisters feeling unsafe and traumatized in our own communities. As an anti-racist organization that is dedicated to social justice, we advocate year-round for policies that protect racially oppressed community members. We are committed to standing in solidarity and collective action with all those experiencing racism and to collaborating with our APA coalition partners in their fight to combat anti-Asian hate, white supremacy, systemic racism, and misogyny. It is time to build a system of racial justice and equity that serves us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Public Advocate Jamani Williams. Um, my name is Vanessa Leung. I'm co-executive director of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. CACF, the nation's only pan-Asian children's policy advocacy organization, we believe that the fight against racism needs to be a fight that we do together and that we can be strong advocates for the Asian American communities and loudly say Black Lives Matter. Because the hard work of anti-racism has to be done together to address head on our country's racist past and dismantle the oppressive systems that have been built. We all denounce the hate and violence we've been seeing, but we as a city have to do so much more in both the short term and the long term. We need to make sure our communities are heard, safe and respected and supported by the culturally competent, language accessible community-based organizations in their neighborhoods. But the long-term work is the real threat of white supremacy thinking. CACF is committed to the long, hard work of solidarity, coalition building, and systems change, which goes to the roots of what we are seeing today. Imagine a city where our children and families feel safe, heard, and taken care of, where a pandemic is not yet another threat to those most marginalized and already struggling. That is a world without heat, without fear, and that's the one that we must all try to build. We know that racism is a public health crisis and Asian American children and families cannot lead safe and healthy lives unless we tackle the real issues we face of poverty, overcrowded housing, and we build a health system that makes the effort to reach us and not render us invisible. And we see racism fed with the lack of culturally responsive education and ethnic studies in our schools. When our kids are not given the tools to understand themselves, 
to connect and empathize with others and to understand our shared collective story, we are not preparing our young people to live in this world. As Asian Americans, we've learned that our acceptance as American is conditional. We saw when our highest office scapegoated us for a global pandemic and a failed response. But we've seen it throughout history. We've seen how the model minority myth erases our struggles and our pains, as well as create a wedge for white supremacy to spread. So CECS stands ready to work to start dismantling the systems that have caused so much trauma in all of our communities. And this is our call to action, and we are so grateful for our partners in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call up the last uh, few speakers. Uh, Ali Kaba from the Muslim Community Network, Stephanie Wu from Hunger Free America, uh, Reem Ramadan from Anti-Violence Project, and Biju Kashi from South Asian Bar Association. And if Sophie Elman Golan is here from Jay Freight as well. My name is uh, Ali. I am from the Muslim Community Network. Uh, can you guys hear me? My name is uh, Ali. I am from the Muslim Community Network. Uh, I just have a statement from MCN. And also, I want to thank Sir Gideon Wuna for hosting this. This is very important. Uh, MCN is really sad about what happened in Atlanta, in Georgia. We found it very um, disturbing and appalling. And since the start of this pandemic, our Asian, Ameri our Asian American brother and sister has experienced an increase in hate, uh, hate crime and target attack, and this must stop. And we are standing in solidarity along our Asian American brother and sister. We condemn all acts of hatred and lend a listening ear to the Asian community during this uh, painful time. The Muslim community is no, is no stranger to hate. We have been a victim of the hate scene of 9-11. One of our popular programs in the past has been our self-defense workshop for the Muslim women who came to us in highest on numbers to find ways to help protect themselves against assault. MCN has been working with our interfaith partner for years to help deepen the understanding of the Muslim American. Our diversity work in school is one of our most impactful to help combat hate and bullying in school. MCN was, grace, uh, was graceful to receive our funding for the hate crime prevention initiative that the city council funded last year. And with that funding, MCN was able to launch a hate crime survey where we collected nearly 200 uh, surveys from the individuals and youth throughout New York City. What we learned is that this is a world before coronavirus is that the hate is still prevalent even in a city as diverse and multicultural as New York City. We develop our own network with Majid to our New York City where we disseminate information about the city hate crime reporting system and through this work we are able to gain the trust of the community to report the hate crime. We collected 200 surveys and we found that the young children and women are the most at risk of being a victim of hate crime, of hate. Variable abuse and damage to business and a personal item like cars, which don't always are considered as a hate crime, is very prevalent. We, are, we were very certain that the city council did not renew the funding in this area because our work of remained incomplete. There's still, there, there's still continue to be four hours for the priorities of politics, a polarizing politics of the last of federal administration. We need more programs similar to Broken Break, Breaking Bread to help the community together so that we can, so that they can understand and foster solidarity with uh, each other. The Muslim, uh, the MCN has pivot our uh, pivot has pivot our work to advocacy such as the push for the resolution of 1257, which brings religious diversity training to New York City. We are continuing to remain in solidarity our Asian and Sikh and Jewish and all minority com community to combat white supremacy and hate throughout our city. Thank you. Thank you. you uh, Stephanie, I was just going to ask, I know it's cold, I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity if we can paraphrase some of it. Thank you. It would be helpful. Thank you. So, 
super brief. My name is Stephanie Wu Winter. I'm with Hunger Free America. I'm uh, the director of strategic volunteer initiatives with Hunger Free America. We are a nonprofit focused on eradicating domestic hunger through advocacy, policy, and direct services. And the direct services is what I want to talk to you about um, specifically today in terms of reaching our communities and why we're supporting Jumani's Ask and why we're calling out on our government officials to really fund programs like this. We, as an agency, want to meet folks where they are at. We, I, as an uh, organization, we are super diverse. We speak multiple languages to reach communities. Um, and that's been really tough, uh, not only for personal concerns in our staff, but because of the concerns of the population that we serve, who have been afraid through this pandemic, not only for health concerns, but because of racism um, and acts that have prevented them from coming out into the communities. Um, we just feel that as an organization, we need to be stronger, support each other. We are allies and it is enough, enough in this community, enough in this country, enough in this city. Uh, we stand with all um, across the country in solidarity to lift up uh, these words and the words of my fellow colleagues here and advocates and, and I thank Advocate Jamani Williams for your words and your support in our community. Um, we stand in solidarity with you and all. Thanks. Reem? Uh, Reem Ramadan? Uh, followed by BG, BG, sorry, from South Asian Group. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Salam alaikum. My name is Reem Ramadan from the New York City Anti Violence Project. I'm the lead organizer. Thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone behind me who's showing up on such a cold day to advocate for your communities. Uh, the New York City Anti Violence Project, we aim to end all forms of violence through organizing and education and supporting survivors through counseling and advocacy within the LGBTQ and HIV affected communities. AVP was founded in 1980 as a 24-hour hotline to respond to incidents of violence because the NYPD has never kept us safe and so we did. And now, 41 years later, we are the largest anti-LGBTQ violence organization in the country and we are still here responding to hate violence incidents. AVP was one of the founding organizations of the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative, along with eight other organizations. The, the initiative was to fund these organizations that are on the ground, that are culturally competent, that offer services to historically criminalized communities. And the time that we needed the services the most, the city decided to cut the funding. In the middle of a global pandemic, that skyrocketed our community's exposure to violence, especially the Asian American and immigrant communities. And the answer to hate violence is not heightened security. That does nothing but increase policing and surveil our communities. We need the city to find ways to not only respond to violence when it happens, but to make sure that it doesn't happen again. To get to the root of it and to work towards prevention. We can do this by investing in community-based models, invest in housing and mental health services, and other non-carceral approaches that meet the everyday needs of New Yorkers. LGBTQ hate crimes capture only 14% of all hate crimes, but they comprise 37% of all violent hate crimes. Our community leads in violent hate crimes against all other bias categories, and AVP offers the tools and services that our community needs through the hotline where we offer counseling, legal support, and hold regular bystander intervention trainings. The amount of LGBTQ folks that call our hotline to report violence exceeds the number of calls of hate crimes reported to the NYPD. This is why we're here today, to ask the city to restore funding to the hate violence prevention initiative that was cut in FY21 budget to, to include Asian-led organizations doing anti-violence work because we believe that the only lasting solution to end hate violence can be shaped by communities most impacted and by relying on our communities, on us, to come together, to organize across identities and to address the underlying forms of oppression that fuel fear and hate. Thank you to public advocate Jumani Williams for standing with us today to put pressure on the city to offer the resources we need to keep our people safe. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Uh, Bijou, Sophie, and Anthony from Chauncey Young Parrot, you can come up oh, and just close out. Okay. 
Yeah. You want to speak? Which people? I have it on the list. Sophie? Yeah. And uh, Anthony? Anthony is happy. And Anthony is black. Okay, okay, so just come up. And it's, it's cold and I'll keep it brief. <laughs> Uh, good morning, I'm Bijou Koshi. I'm a district leader in Staten Island as well as a director of the South Asian Bar Association of New York. And I just wanted to come here to join uh, as we mourn the lost souls uh, in Atlanta with our brothers and sisters here. And also to just thank the public advocate, Jamani Williams, for uh, uh, forming this coalition of, um, South, of Asian and South Asian organizations and community leaders that we can come together and lift up our voices because uh, as we know now, Words do matter, and it's it's time that the action meets that as well, so that we can make sure that a horrific act like this never happens again, and that we educate those um, to make sure that the hearts and minds are won over. So thank you, Advocate Williams. Hi, I'm Sophie Amangolan from Jews for Racial and Economic Justice and the NYC Against Hate Initiative. Two years ago, the NYC Against Hate Initiative uh, introduced um, introduced a call for uh, a hate, the hate violence prevention um, initiative. And then last year, that funding was cut. Um, and it's incredibly disappointing. And uh, today, we're calling for um, not only the restoration of all of that funding for all of the groups that are part of the NYC Against Hate Coalition, but also for expanding that funding to robustly resource our Asian partners who are on the front lines fighting for the com their communities in this crisis. What we do not need is solutions that rely on increased policing um, or escalating hate crimes prosecution. We need solutions that rely on our community members. A perfect example of this is that Asian members of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice came together and started an initiative called Jews for Asians, showing up of Jews of all ethnicities, showing up for Asian people of all faiths. Um, and now we have over 400 people who are signed up just in a matter of days to do uh, community safety trainings and show up and provide security at vigils that are taking place this weekend, all without the involvement of the NYPD because we can keep each other safe. And we need funding for initiatives like that to actually scale up and expand. Thank you. You told us how strong here. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. With Coalition for Asian Men, Children, and Families, last year we created the People of Color Health Justice Campaign. Why we did that? Because we knew that racism was going to make this pandemic even worse, and the pain will be even harder. My heart goes out with the victims that had, were shot in Atlanta. But we know that white supremacy has fueled racism, misogyny, violence against women, and all people of color. We know as I know, as a Latino male, as a Puerto Rican, born and raised in this neighborhood, is my community myself had experienced all forms of oppression and violent hate and attacks also on the Asian Pacific Island must be seen as an attack on all of us. White power structures use us as pawns so that we spend our energy fighting each other rather than working together and fighting for the true orchestrators of the oppression. We have to be brave, we have to be courageous. There's no longer a shell game with money that's supposed to go into communities. We have to stop. Let's not have this false sense of security that over-policing is going to work. It is not. There is money. There is stimulus dollars coming to the city and the state. There is money. And if we have to shuffle it, if we have to move it, that's what we must do in order to protect communities of color and to stop agent hate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, Chinese Benevolent Association, Taipei Cultural and Political Center, and SAPNA uh, uh, for being here. Uh, just two things I wanted to add that are ancillary but connected. As I mentioned, this is what happens uh, when we don't recognize how deep white supremacy is in this country. And it's combined with a country that has a demonic obsession to guns, uh, demonic obsession to access to as many guns as people want to have. Lastly, I'll continue to ask law enforcement all across the country uh, that uh, um, from the uh, black and brown community, especially the black community, we're asking uh, that you treat unarmed black Americans the same way you treat armed white Americans who have murdered people and are simply having a bad day. Uh, with that, we're happy to ask, answer any questions that folks have. I'll answer for me, and then folks can answer. Uh, my thing has always been, uh, I think uh, 
law enforcement is good for acute problems and acute situations. And so to the extent that there is an acute problem, some communities may feel comfortable. And so I'm not uh, uh, opposed to that. What I am opposed to is the over-reliance of that and what that brings. And so if that is your response and that's going to be a sustained response, we're only going to see more problems. And so what we need to do and need to focus on even more is investing in the communities that are behind, uh, represented by the folks behind me. You can't cut these folks' programs and then say what we're going to do is send police. These folks are funded to prevent the stuff from happening to begin with. And it's really important that we push back on the miseducation that's been happening for years by funding these uh, communities. And just, I have one other question. Why do you, it seems like this is all coming to a head now towards hopefully the end of the pandemic Well, white supremacy has been here for a while. I don't mean, I mean, I mean the anti-Asian uh, Well, I, I will say that there depends what you define coming to a head. The mass murder is terrible, but these communities have been dealing with a rise of hate crimes long before that. And there's trauma associated with that that maybe wasn't being covered uh, by the media. Uh, but we do see the tentacles of white supremacy, those who are still espous espousing um, uh, these wild uh, ideas and conspiracy theories that are pushing. And just, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before, uh, the intelligence uh, departments were saying uh, that these kinds of uh, crimes may actually increase because people uh, uh, feel more emboldened still. We had four years where the president of the United States was saying things like China virus and Kung flu, like four years of that. And there are people who were supporting him. Those people are still in high places. Uh, those people are still pushing this narrative. Uh, and the end result of that has always been all over the world, these types of acts. Uh, and what we try to do is stop it before it happens. But there are many in this country who continue to want to try to encourage it. And the way we think to push back on that is funding groups like these so, so they have the resources that are needed. Anybody? Okay. Anybody? Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.